A very good afternoon to Pak Yusuf Wanandi and our colleagues from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta and Dr. Narushiga Michishajita from and colleagues from the National Graduate uh, Institute for Policy Studies, National University of Tokyo. I especially recognize Kikuchi San, whom I have known for some 20 years or more on the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific Network. To all our friends and colleagues following this webinar, thank you for making time to join us. And I look forward to joining to you joining our discussion. Uh, this is the second of a series of three webinar seminars on the post-pandemic Indo-Pacific prospects for regional cooperation. The first was on 28 July, at which we heard His Excellency Dr. Marty Nalagatawa speak on the geopolitical ramifications of the COVID-19 crisis. This afternoon, RSS is honored to host the second webinar at which Professor Mary Anthony will be speaking on COVID-19 in Asia, navigating geopolitical risk and unprecedented disruptions. I now would like to invite our Executive Deputy Chairman of RSS, Ambassador Ong King Yong, to deliver his uh, welcome uh, remarks. Uh, Ambassador Ong, please. Good afternoon to all of you. As uh, Mr. Kwa Chong Wan has said, this is the second of three seminars we plan on the web. We have the first one delivered by former Indonesian Foreign Minister, Dr. Marty Nadarakawa. It was a very uh, sobering delivery by Dr. Marty. My takeaway from that seminar on the web is really that uh, new reality out there in the world today has been intensified and in fact accelerated by all these disruption caused by the COVID-19 and the accompanying challenges facing the global community from the contestation, the rivalries of the major powers. So, going forward, all these disruptions are going to pose greater demand on leadership and their respective form of governance for the sake of global economic development, security and prosperity. Today, RSS is proud to have Professor Mary to continue this discussion. I will not say much about her delivery because I think she should tell you what she has in her uh, address herself. Just to say that we hope that this second part will further illuminate what Dr. Marty had uh, referred to in his uh, statement a few weeks ago. And hopefully, we look forward to also to the third seminar on the web, where our colleagues from Japan, from GRIPS groups, will also share their views and bring together a bit of closure on all the three perspectives. What I want to say now is that there is no doubt the world has changed and I do not subscribe to the idea that there is a new normal. It is not a new normal, it is a transformed situation. Uh, it is new definitely, uh, unprecedented normal. I don't know we call it, I don't know whether we can call it new normal or normal. So what it's all about, we will listen to all the experts and today uh, Mandy will talk a bit more about what 
all these mean for us who know about the global order as it has been until COVID-19 hit us and what the future lies for us. So thank you very much for all of you joining in. I will uh, speak to you again after the uh, uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Manny. Thank you. Prof. Melanthony, the floor is yours. Uh, I believe you have established the study of non-traditional security as a field, and you have written the textbook on that subject. Well, Anthony, your floor is yours for the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chong Guan. Let me first thank my colleagues from RSIS. And um, it's wonderful also to have my friends from CSIS, by Yusuf Wanandi, and friends from GRIPS who have yet to see. Um, it's wonderful to be able to join this second series in uh, webinars that's jointly organized by three, our three institutions. I have chosen to speak on the big issue that has seized us today, uh, which is COVID-19 pandemic. And while there have been a number of webinars already held on this issue and, and tons of articles that have been written about it, I wish to join this conversation and share my thoughts about how I see the pandemic affecting the governance and uh, geopolitics of Asia. And I also would like to reflect on the imperatives of this development for our work on multilateralism in Asia. Just by way of providing a context to my discussion, let me begin by offering some observations about COVID-19. We often talked about black swans. These are unexpected events that have low probability of happening, but when it does, it has very severe consequences or high impact. COVID-19 is a crisis that's called the black swan. It's been defined as a crisis like no other, an extraordinary is existential threat to humanity in modern history. When I think about black swans, I think about what would come close before COVID-19, something that would approximate the kind of disruptions that we face now. And I think about 9-11. It was consequential in the kind of disruptions that it has caused, but also it challenged or it busted the invincibility of the US as a superpower. It led to a very prolonged and difficult war that has sown deep divisions within countries around the world and even among nations and societies that continues to profoundly be felt until now and to a large extent disrupted some of our ways of doing things. Think for example of the behavioral changes that we have to do and uh, when we travel and the kind of security, la layers of security that we have to take before we even board an aircraft. In terms of the kind of disruption, COVID-19 pandemic affects all countries, rich and poor. It doesn't choose a race, an age, gender. And unlike SARS, another health crisis that we faced in 2003 and H1N1, no country is actually spared. And until now, many states around the world, including us here in Asia, are still struggling to contain the virus. As the economist noted, for every country that is able to contain the virus, like for example, Vietnam or Singapore, there are many more in other parts of the world, like South Asia, and in Latin America, and even in the United States, where it is still raging. Science is also still playing catch up in understanding the behavior of this virus. And while many of us non-scientists are trying to also catch up with the kind of data and information that we have. According to the MIT, for every recorded death, there are 12 others unrecorded. 
And I'm sure in this part of the world, it's more than 12. In terms of the very nature and the extent of the disruption, the fact that most of the world essentially shut down resulted in an unprecedented economic crisis of global proportions. With borders closed and business travels halted, tourism and other industries are almost decimated. I heard that planes have to fly empty just to upkeep its maintenance. The near paralysis of economic activities is making this pandemic-induced economic crisis as the worst, the worst recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Global forecasts and projections of economic growth have had to be amended maybe once, twice, three times as dark clouds loom over when this the global economy would actually recover. But more significantly, that's my third observation, is the fact that COVID-19 has emerged at the time when the international strategic environment is in a state of flux and is undergoing significant structural changes. Prior to the pandemic, we always, there's been a lot of talk about the shifts in gravity of power to Asia in light of the perceived waning of US power and leadership. So we talk about from Pax Americana to Pax Oceania. Arguably, this view has been getting a lot more traction during the start of the Trump administration as we witnessed how rapidly the U.S. has become more isolationist, more protectionist, less interested in multilateralism, and have become more visibly absent in the global arena. What do these developments mean for stability in Asia? My main proposition is that COVID-19 is rocking the very foundations of Asian security and could just be the tipping point that trigger more instability and conflict. If I were to use a ver the virus in a metaphor, it's like the virus is basically storming the hearts and lungs of Asian security. This therefore compels us to seriously rethink some of our assumptions about how we keep peace and maintain security in the region. Now let me raise four assumptions as it relates to the kind to the pillars that we have, pillars to Asian security. First is US leadership and its commitment to regional security. COVID-19 has brought to the fore critical questions about continued reliance on the US, not only as a global leader, but as a critical provider of Asia's security. As a resident power in Asia, the U.S. has provided the security umbrella that allowed regional countries, particularly here in ASEAN, to grow their economies while enjoying peace and stability. Many countries in the region have benefited significantly from, econo from the U.S.'s economic assistance, trade and investments, and its open markets. Asia's status as a vibrant economic region a manufacturing hub and a major node of global supply chains own much, owes much to the security and stability provided by the US. Don't get me wrong though, I, I don't discount the important contribution of ASEAN and other institutions, but I will come to that in a while. Now, despite some lackluster performance, the US engagement in Asia continues. In spite of the demands it faced as a global power having multiple priorities and interests in other parts of the world. While we here seek more of its attention as we navigate the waves of power transitions in the region with the rapid rise of China and the growing reality of its becoming a regional, if not already a challenging uh, global hegemon. Over decades, China has become not only the second biggest economy in the world, but also the most important economic partner and investor to many countries in Asia. China's establishment of the AIIB and the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, 
provide the clearest indication of how it sees itself occupying a dominant place in Asia. Now, how U.S. responds to a more powerful and confident China is a test of its ability to hold on to the hegemonic position, more so now with COVID-19, and particularly at this time when U.S.-China relations are fractious in all fronts. What we want to avoid is the Thucydides trap, um, some a term coined by Graham Allison, where the hegemon's fear of a rush, rising power triggers competition and ultimately leads to confrontation and even war. Now, U.S. leadership is compelling not only for its material power, but also for its soft power, its ideology, the norms and values that it professes and promotes, and its commitment to a rules-based international order and support for international institutions have allowed the U.S. to maintain its coveted position as a global leader able to provide global public goods. However, COVID-19 has seriously tested U.S. leadership in this critical juncture when the whole world is faced with an existential threat. U.S. leadership has been visibly absent. And from what we have seen so far, its own response in battling the pandemic, even in its own territory, has been less than satisfactory. Despite having the world's best centers for disease controls, the top epidemiologists, the state-of-the-art medical centers, and the other centers of excellence in scientific research, technology, and innovation, its dismal performance in containing the virus, is in stark contrast to its leadership in fighting Ebola, H1N1, and HIV AIDS in the recent past. In fact, it was in 2014 when the U.S. actually spearheaded the establishment of the global health security agenda, a global effort to build and strengthen the world's ability to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious diseases, whether from accident, natural, or intentional causes. The US CDC has led this effort involving 67 countries in boosting pandemic preparedness and response and help countries strengthen their public health systems. Now, having worked closely with the WHO, the US's decision, therefore, to stop funding the WHO and its threat to withdraw its membership can only cause more harm in the global fight against COVID and other emerging infectious diseases. This would have severe repercussions on the future of this body and its ability to provide critical technical assistance, particularly to developing countries. Questions on US leadership extends beyond this withdrawal uh, from the WHO, but also from other international commitments such as the TPP, the very critical Par Paris Climate Change Agreement, and even the uh, JCPA or the Iran nuclear deal. Nevertheless, Southeast Asia recognizes the criticality of US leadership, not only to regional, but also to global security. Now, the second assumption is sustained economic development of the region. In the last 20 and 30 years, Asia has been one of the most dynamic regions in the world due to its rapid and stellar economic growth. While regional security and stability has been instrumental in its economic success, countries in the region have also benefited from good relations and economic opportunities provided by countries like Japan in industrializing their economies and the increasing trade and investment opportunities, especially with the opening up of China in the mid 1980s. In the mid 80s, sorry. While China, India, Japan and ASEAN countries, all these four, Asia now makes up almost half of the global economy. ASEAN alone, if it were a single market with a 
has a close to about three trillion US dollars combined economy will be the largest, the sixth largest economy in the world. The region is also home to a large share of global supply chains and production networks. But with COVID-19 and the long periods of lockdown, travel restrictions, supply chain disruptions, persistent social distancing and border closures, the economic fallout for the global economy has been so severe and extensive putting the region under extreme economic stress. The IMF projects that the global economy will contract by minus four to 4.9%. Uh, and for East Asia, this means economic contractions ranging from minus one to minus 6%. Economic contraction is also reflected in trade performance. The WTO expects world trade to drop substantially in the 13 to 32% range in 2020. As global 19 pandemic grounded global activity to a near standstill, it has severely impacted domestic demand, especially private investment and consumer spending. But its impact on the local economy, especially on SMEs, has been so devastating, resulting in many businesses closing down and workers being laid off or forced to take leave. Given that the SMEs contribute up to 90% of total employment in many Asian countries, you can imagine the concerns of rising unemployment that faces most governments in the region. Now, the impact of this deep and expectedly prolonged crisis which as many economists as Warren can also metastasize into a financial crisis, brings back to me the crisis we faced in Southeast Asia in 1997 during the Asian financial crisis, when massive economic displacement, extreme misery, frustration and anger had led to violent demonstrations and resulted in changes or even fall in some political regimes in the region. So governments are therefore doing whatever it takes to fight the pandemic, rolling out significant fiscal stimulus measures ranging from one to more than 20% of their GDP. Third is the China card, China's peaceful rise or the China conundrum. To us in Asia, China is a reality in our doorstep. ASEAN states, therefore, are mindful of the need to cultivate good relations with China. But COVID-19 has revealed the widening power asymmetry between China and Southeast Asia. Now think about when SARS broke out in 2003. Just in terms of economic power, China only accounted to 4% of the global GDP. But 17 years after SARS, it now makes up close to 20%. Given that ASEAN and China are integral to global supply chains, particularly in the manufacturing sector, and 20% of intermediate manufacturing like goods like automotive and telecommunications equipment come from China, it only accentuates further its growing economic influence and shown how this power asymmetry has given it more latitude to become more assertive militarily and diplomatically. We saw this military assertiveness in the contested waters in the region, and it has even become more, uh, it became even more audacious, audacious during this pandemic. Within the month of April alone, Chinese fish, fishing and coastal vessels strayed into the waters of Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, went to the Philippines, Thito Islands, and in the coast, uh, coast of um, Malaysia, and brazenly established two administrative districts for the contested islands in the Paracels and Spratlys. This unilateral move by China could not have come at a worse time when it was promoting its mass diplomacy and extending significant medical assistance to countries 
that were in desperate need of medical supplies to contain COVID-19. Thus, while China actually had the opportunity to exercise its leadership in battling COVID-19 by demonstrating its own success in containing the pandemic in its own uh, ground and providing critical assistance, not just to states in Asia, but also in Europe, its belligerence and its wealth diplomacy wasted that opportunity and only reinforce the trust deficit it has with many countries in the region. Note, for example, a recent uh, publication from the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies here in Singapore about its sur the survey that it conducted on ASEAN perceptions and attitudes towards China. Its findings show that compared to other dialogue partners of ASEAN, China is the least trusted despite the economic, deep economic ties and its ability to provide public good through BRI and its declarations about grow with us geoeconomic strategy. Now, during this extraordinary period, China has failed to do the right thing and act as a responsible holder, stakeholder in Asia. President Xi's wish, therefore, for China's rise to be beneficial to others and its statements about common destiny rung hollow and are disconnected with its inability to exercise restraint. Fourth is our assumptions about the ASEAN, our Asian multilateral institutions. COVID-19 presents a huge challenge to Asia's biggest assets, its multilateral institutions, particularly ASEAN and the ASEAN-led institutions like the ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Plus Three, and the East Asia Summit, as well as the economic frameworks like the AEC and RCEP. These institutions have served as important pillars of regional security, stability, and prosperity. But COVID-19 has exacerbated pressures on the ability of our institutions to carry out their mission. Take the case of US and China and the goal of maintaining regional peace. Despite having the ARF and the AES, ASEAN remains largely a bystander in the sharpening tensions between the US and China. Since COVID-19, there's been a lot of concerns expressed, not only by analysts, but also by political leaders about the escalating conflicts between these two major powers. In the Foreign Affairs magazine article in July and August of 2020, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong wrote about the endangered Asian century, raising serious concerns about US-China confrontation and its implications on Asia's security. Similarly, former Australian Prime Minister, also Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, published two foreign affairs articles in July and most recently in August, 3rd of August, raising the prospect of a new Cold War. He calls it Cold War 1.5 and the increasing prospect of an armed conflict between US and China. Now, much of this concern stems not just from China's increasing aggression, but also from the hardening position on the part of the US. Last month, the US uh, Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, announced a change in its stance on and openly rejecting the international validity of all of China's maritime claims. Whereas before the US only declared interest in maintaining freedom of navigation, its recent move to openly reject China's position and its ramping up of air and maritime operations in the South China Sea has certainly raised temperatures foreboding an escalation of conflict. One therefore wonders whether COVID-19 could just be the tipping point that leads to an open confrontation. If you see it against China's relentless military buildup, which according to uh, CIPRI is now translated to its rapid increase in military spending over the last 10 years of up to 18%, 85%, compared with the US defense cuts of minus 15%. 
This significantly alters the military balance in the region, not to mention China's gray zone strategy in the South China Sea, East China Sea, and the Taiwan Straits. One just fervently hopes that these military weapons will never be used. With these four assumptions, we therefore ask ourselves, what does this mean for our work on multi multilateralism, particularly here in Southeast Asia? Where does this lead us? COVID-19 is a grim reminder of how critical international cooperation and global solidarity are to battling the disease. It is also a reminder that we need to work on all four elements if we were to get through this crisis together. On the US, we need to be able to engage soon after the elections, the new administration and hopefully it's uh, President Biden to quickly recalibrate its protectionist policies and renew engagement and commitment to multilateralism. It has to, we need to remind him about the Asia pivot and make it better at Asian pivot 1.5 and perhaps true frameworks like the ASEAN Indo-Pacific framework of the Indo-Pacific or it can be invigorated as platforms to reset relations, provide deeper engagement with the region and set out priorities to improve economic relations, trade and investments. For China, it needs to be told that it has to seriously think about how it wants to be perceived as a global power. A leader does that not, that, that, that's not resort to a la carte selective leadership where in certain issues it espouses cooperative security, but on other behaves like an unrestrained hegemon. Aside from not falling into the Thucydides trap, China must also avoid what Joseph Nye calls the Kindle burger trap, which is the danger of a rising hegemon that doesn't act quickly and substantive enough to provide the global public goods. And as far as our institutions are concerned, we need to seriously ask ourselves whether the narrative or, or the story of ASEAN is still compelling. Are we actually doing enough to respond to these new kinds of challenges? Now, we, when you talk about new 21st century challenges, we're not only thinking about COVID-19, but this big gloomy threat of climate change as well. To be sure, we cannot be expected to deal with all of them at the same time. But when we think of ASEAN centrality, we cannot surely be content to only be the conveners of meetings. Instead, we need to be able to capitalize the privilege of being able to set the agenda and facilitate a problem, the problem solving rather than settle for declarations that are more aspirational in nature. As we face the economic challenges head on, ASEAN must press ahead with its economic initiatives like the AEC and ASEPT. In fact, COVID-19 provides us, allows us to take advantage of some of the movements, the reshoring and ongoing configurations of supply chain. I heard, for example, announcement by Japan of its support for companies that are relocating from China back to uh, Japan, but also supporting companies to relocate their operations in Southeast Asia. That I think is something that provides some opportunities. For our economies in the region. Now in dealing with the number of political and security problems, ASEAN's brand of inclusive regionalism remains a precious asset that must be protected and promoted because it pre presents us with the opportunities to put our minds and resources together to address common challenges. There's a good reason to go back to the basics of cooperative and comprehensive security, which have become even more important approaches under this new kind of circumstances. 
Hence, in the battle to contain COVID-19, ASEAN's current cooperative efforts in dealing with this pandemic, in promoting economic resilience and food security need to be further strengthened and work and ASEAN has to be able to do this in partnership with other partners of other countries in the region like China, Japan, South Korea and the others. We note the work done by our health officials in information sharing using mechanisms of regional health cooperation like the emergency operating systems and we also note the commitment to funding research into vaccines and other therapeutics and the plans of putting up a regional stockpile of essential medical supplies which can be readily deployed for emergency needs. But more can certainly be done in this regard and I would like to see ASEAN working with other countries to respond to the agenda of vaccine access and distribution against the disturbing trends of vaccine nationalism. The idea of having an agreement of stockpiling vaccines as soon as they are uh, considered to be uh, safe and, and, and working and efficacious should seriously be studied by ASEAN to ensure that member states and affected communities will have access to these vaccines and the allocation of the vaccines should actually be made on the basis of public health need rather than the size of a country's purse. In fact, this idea has already been mentioned by the Malaysian Foreign Minister Hishamuddin Hussein, who has proposed this idea to, to China and the US working with ASEAN to make this possible. He's argued for the possibility of even ASEAN producing and manufacturing these vaccines. Note that vaccines have their own supply chain as well. You do need bottles to contain, uh, to, to, uh, to put all these vaccines. You need the syringe, you need the, uh, you know, the adjuvants. All of these parts can be put together. And since Asia, uh, ASEAN is a manufacturing hub, there's of course the possibility to, for us to take part in this global chain of vaccine manufacturing. ASEAN can work with the WHO and others like the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation or CEPI that finances independent research to develop vaccines it can work with um, other countries like Japan, Germany and the UK that are also uh, already developing their own vaccines as well as work with the Gavi Vaccine Alliance or even the international vaccine institutes. I think it is important for us to go beyond what is possible and having the idea of a vaccine, you know, uh, a, a regional pool of vaccines is something that we should really seriously consider. In the end, it is, the con it is in continuing with what we already have and boldly venturing out into something new where ASEAN centrality becomes even more meaningful for member states and communities in the region and where ASEAN centrality becomes credible to the wider region and beyond. In the end, ASEAN's approach of inclusive regionalism, of comprehensive and cooperative security are the many pathways to address and to deal with the crisis that we face today. Thank you. Thank you, Melly, for that presentation, a very wide ranging presentation. Um, before I invite our commentators Dr. Philip Bermonte, let me first uh, take you back to the SARS where you were leading RSIS in trying to coordinate uh, the prospects of a more regional approach to the, to the SARS back in 2003. Could I ask you to bear in mind later, how would you compare the regional response to the SARS then and 
COVID uh, today here. Uh, Dr. Philip Bomonte, the uh, floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Park Kwa Chong Guan, and, and thank you, RSIS, for inviting me to be the discussion of the uh, presentation today. Uh, thank you, Professor Meli Antoni, for such a detailed uh, presentation. Uh, I would uh, make uh, several points uh, as a response to the presentation and uh, probably contribute to the overall discussion of our today's webinar. Uh, as I understood, this webinar uh, is intended to examine uh, implication of multifaceted threats that uh, we are facing to the regional order uh, and uh, try to find the imperative for multilateralism and uh, global governance in dealing with the pandemic. Now, uh, let me start by saying that the, uh, for sure, the pandemic is, uh, as the, the term implies, it's a global problem, uh, global in nature, uh, that requires a global uh, resolution or global response. And uh, secondly, uh, now we know that uh, for many countries, uh, probably for all countries, uh, public health is also a national security issue. Uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as global as it is, uh, somehow pandemic is also uh, very domestic in nature because uh, we have to deal with uh, various uh, domestic factors uh, that will affect how uh, the international community responds to the pandemic. It, it ranges from, uh, from, the, from the nature of the government, the inertia of the government, uh, the behavior of the citizens, and uh, the existence of the health system within countries and so on and so forth. So it is global, but at the same time, it is very local and domestic as well. And uh, uh, as uh, Professor Meli Antoni uh, uh, mentioned in her presentation, that uh, because uh, of the nature, uh, we should find uh, the sources for multilateralism because no country can deal with uh, the pandemic uh, by itself uh, because uh, uh, now it spreads to uh, almost all countries uh, across the globe. Uh, if we agree that uh, multilateralism needs to be strengthened uh, for countries to be able to, to deal with the pandemic together, and now we have to see where the sources of uh, leadership for this uh, uh, renewed multilateralism because uh, before COVID-19 uh, uh, attacked us, we already know that uh, multilateralism as well uh, is under uh, serious threat uh, due to some uh, new development in uh, international relations, uh, mainly uh, because of the uh, uh, strategic competition between uh, the two superpowers, uh, uh, the United States and China. And uh, that's, uh, that being said, uh, I'd like to, to argue that uh, because of the situation that we are facing, we should shift our discussion from the discussion about the possible full-blown uh, confrontation between the U.S. and China to, uh, to find to something that we find ways uh, for cooperation uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, so we should look beyond U.S.-China strategic competition and find other sources of uh, multilateralism. So the source of leadership for multilateral cooperation uh, can come from uh, various sources. Uh, number one, uh, it seems to me that G20, uh, where all the major economy group together, uh, can be a platform uh, for such uh, multilateral uh, cooperation. The G20 can help uh, expanding uh, uh, health investment in various countries. Uh, being a big economy, they can also contribute by lifting, for example, export restriction on critical medicines, medical supplies, uh, 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 even uh, basic food stuff. And uh, I think uh, if they can uh, come together, uh, this uh, type of measures can be discussed among the G20 uh, countries. Uh, the other source, of course, uh, regional organization, I would say, because, you know, uh, sometimes uh, international institution is just too big, 
we have WHO, the United Nations, and, and uh, others. But a regional organization, I think, is in the best position to understand what's going on uh, within borders of their uh, uh, member countries. And uh, for example, uh, I think ASEAN, because uh, uh, we are in Southeast Asia, ASEAN uh, uh, can be strengthened as well. And then the ASEAN can expand uh, cooperation with various international institution. There are existing uh, framework for ASEAN to cooperate with uh, various international uh, institution. Uh, ASEAN has, uh, you know, uh, many uh, activities with WHO. So I think we need to institutionalize and uh, we need to expand uh, this partnership uh, with organizations such as uh, WHO. Uh, for example, uh, we can, uh, ASEAN can cooperate with WHO to ensure and to help uh, member countries to fulfill their uh, obligation un under the international health regulation. And uh, that would, uh, in general, uh, will help uh, at least Southeast Asia uh, to be able uh, to prepare for the next pandemic if uh, the next one uh, or the third one occurs. Also, uh, this is also a problem of uh, development, uh, access to, uh, clean water for example now we are talking about people washing hands more frequently but uh, for sure uh, because of the nature of the level of development uh, we are still suffering from uh, you know in some parts of southeast asia uh, in the urban areas uh, access to uh, clean water for example and so on so asean can also deepen and strengthen uh, cooperation with various development agencies and uh, that would help uh, I think uh, the preparedness and uh, that would help uh, ASEAN to bounce back uh, even faster uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the public health uh, concern under the pandemic. Number three, I think all countries, uh, whether they come uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a, uh, an organization like ASEAN or individually, I think we need to uh, think about how we can uh, increase funds for institutions, uh, multilateral institutions like WHO. And uh, more importantly, I think we need to politically defend the, the, the current multilateral system. Uh, as we know, uh, before the COVID-19, there, uh, there were <clears throat> uh, serious concerns about, uh, for example, the United States withdrawing from various multilateral platforms, from the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, cutting funding for some, uh, cutting contribution, uh, to some of the UN agencies and uh, all, also uh, WHO. So uh, countries, other countries, I think needs to, uh, to be in agreement that we need to politically defend the current multilateral system. Uh, aside from that, uh, you know, the, the competition between the US and China uh, uh, that uh, manifest in, uh, in the form of trade wars, for example, uh, completely, I think, undermine the WHO. TO, uh, World Trade Organization, as a dispute settlement mechanism. So uh, these kind of uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, pressures on the multilateral system, I think we need to find ways uh, to defend so that the, the system could work uh, 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 better uh, in the future. Number four, uh, you know, we've been talking uh, uh, about the international aspects of the pandemic. Uh, for countries uh, uh, to, to defend the multilateral system. The first thing they need to do is to convince their citizens that uh, other countries uh, might be helping them and uh, uh, various international institutions uh, and, and can help them. So in essence, they need to convince their citizens that multilateralism uh, is uh, actually uh, serving and not threatening their national interest. And uh, this is something uh, for so many countries uh, needs to be done. Because uh, before COVID-19, we are also suffering from, uh, you know, the emergence of various populist leader with uh, hyper-nationalistic uh, narratives and so on. But uh, now the time requires us actually uh, to think about uh, uh, dealing with uh, various global uh, problems uh, collaboratively. Uh, number, uh, number five, then the, to convince the citizens, uh, domestic reform is also uh, an imperative. 
uh, because uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, some countries uh, suffer from the inertia of their governments, uh, the, the slow response, the unpreparedness, and then the various uh, governance issues uh, that cost them a lot uh, not to be able to respond uh, quickly and rightly and uh, on time uh, uh, to deal with the, the pandemic. So I think domestic reform uh, uh, is also needed and then that is something uh, that uh, needs to be done uh, very, very quickly so that uh, you know, the, the problem uh, of the inertia of, of the government will not uh, reoccur uh, if uh, you know, uh, there is a second uh, pandemic or a third pandemic uh, coming uh, in the future. So uh, uh, number five, I think this is also debates going on within borders, within countries, uh, that uh, we may need to, uh, you know, we may come at the point where we need to tolerate more interventionist government policies you know, for the economic recovery, uh, helping the need, the needy, uh, you know, the poor and so on, that uh, would require uh, so many interventionist policy. So we need to find a balance between the uh, kind of a healthy uh, market mechanism. At the same time, we also need government in, uh, interventionist policies. Number six, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, we suffered from hoax, uh, from uh, various uh, misinformation, you know, because of uh, political issues across the globe. And uh, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, we will not be able to uh, contain and to deal with the pandemic if this trend continues. Because uh, pandemic, the, the, the health problem requires trust in, in information and, and, and science and uh, evidence-based uh, discussions need to be uh, fostered because this is something technocratic and uh, we cannot afford if uh, hoax uh, continues and uh, people and citizens mistrust, uh, uh, distrust their governments and, and uh, their, for example, health authority. And uh, we should find the ways how to revive trust in, uh, in information and science among the citizens across the globe. Uh, lastly, I would say uh, this is just uh, COVID-19 uh, is just one uh, form of disasters. And uh, Southeast Asia is a region uh, that is very prone to various disasters. And uh, so that uh, uh, I would say uh, governments, especially in, in Southeast Asia, uh, with ASEAN, we need to collaborate more uh, on uh, disasters education program across the region and probably across the globe that uh, we have to deal with the nature, the mother nature, that uh, maybe we've been uh, forgetting about you know, how to deal with, uh, how to uh, take care of our own uh, nature. So that, uh, I think, uh, my uh, response to uh, Professor Meli uh, Antoni uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, return the microphone to the moderator. moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pramonte, um, for that bringing us back to the local context and what we need to do at the local level. And here, again, my before I pass the floor and invite our Japanese colleague, uh, I'd like to remind or ask Meli, you may remember that in the SARS, one issue was early warning. How do we get early warning of a uh, pandemic. And the problem there was that WHO was quite inefficient and still is. So if we want to get more early warnings and there are gonna be no more new cycles of this pandemic as we can see, can we look to NGOs? Can track to our think tanks here, suggest how we can marshal and coordinate and work with the NGOs. Indonesia, the Muhammadiyah has a fantastic network of clinics all over Indonesia. Is it possible that they will provide a better early warning and monitoring system of the COVID in Indonesia than the government hospital networks here? So I leave that thought with you. And now we'll invite our Japanese colleague, Dr. Suzuki, to uh, her response to what 
can we do? Yeah, the Suzuki, please. Professor Suzuki. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for giving me uh, opportunity to be here as a discussant. You know, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, to to join the discussions on, on this you know very important topic. And then uh, the uh, then I and then it's it was, it's really good for me to see you know all the friends you know from uh, ASEAN ISIS and, and then uh, uh, Professor Anthony, thank you very much for giving a talk uh, on such an interesting topic. I, I learned a lot actually because, you know, I think right now we need to, to understand, we need to know, you know, how we should understand the you know, situations, how, you know, linking to the, you know, international relations in, in, in Asia. So I, I learned a lot from you, uh, from your uh, lectures. Uh, so uh, today I I would like to talk uh, the, about like two topics, and I think you know me, uh, uh, Mr. Kwa has already like mentioned about like uh, about the experience uh, on in in uh, when when ASEAN members you know uh, facing the uh, the SARS in two thousand three. So uh, I would I'd like to also like pick up that kind of history of the ASEAN efforts to to deal with the SARS and how you know uh, how they uh, try to use the experience to to the current situation and facing the COVID nineteen uh, because you know uh, personally I'm interested in like uh, ASEAN governance in uh, non traditional security and the doctor you know uh, Professor Asri is already like wrote, wrote it, uh, several articles about like ASEAN governance in non traditional security although like ASEAN is like uh, try to maintain like uh, non interference policies you know. Uh, sovereignty and all things, all things, but I think non-traditional security is one of the important topics, you know, uh, for ASEAN to get involved in the domestic issues without, like, you know, provoking, you know, highly political, like, you know, discussions. So I think the COVID-19, in a way that, you know, give the opportunity uh, to ASEAN to develop, you know, its, uh, in, its governance, you know, uh, in, 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 in non-traditional securities. So I agree uh, with uh, you know, Professor, uh, Professor Anthony that you know, talk to talk that ASEAN needs to strengthen uh, the partnership, partnership with direct, direct partners to raise their funds or to, to get assistance you know, in every kind of aspect because ASEAN itself you know, doesn't have like, much capacity to, you know, to deal with the topic. You know, although like, I agree that ASEAN is a like, great agenda setter you know, for, to frame uh, the, uh, the issue areas, you know, uh, the, to try to, uh, to get a, a, attention from the uh, partners. But I think we need to, uh, they need to like, you know, uh, to, to be engaged in discussion with dialogue partners, especially like Japan or like India, or the US and China. And they try to get attention from them, like to, you know, to, to say that, you know, this, this COVID-19, for example, is a kind of important topic to, to cooperate with each other. Right, and then and then I I would like to like share my thought with you know, how you know ASEAN you know uh, ASEAN members you know, try to develop their governance in in this area it's because uh, uh, last January I visited in Jakarta uh, to to have interviews with like uh, several like officials in AHA Center uh, ASEAN coordinating uh, center for humanitarian assistance and disaster management. You know, it seems to me like AHA is one of the organizations you know to be utilized, to be able to be utilized for like uh, even for COVID nineteen situation. So I'm I'm just wonder you know whether we you know ASEAN you know should develop a new organizations you know or you know. For especially for like a disease, pandemic disease, or like, you know, uh, they can actually use the existing organizations to, 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 you know, to combat. So I think, you know, that's how, how, like my comment is how is whether, uh, how, you know, ASEAN should develop the governance, you know, in, in this, in these situations. Right. And then, um, uh, so I, I, I'd like to know if, you know, uh, 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 Professor Anthony, you know, if you, if you can tell us more about the experience, you know, of the SARS and the history of the, you know, ASEAN, you know, governance in, 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 in disease, you know, disease, pandemic disease uh, in, in, that, in that aspect. And then uh, I think that compared to SARS, 
I think the COVID-19 is more global, you know, situation, maybe more like, you know, uh, worldwide uh, the problem. So I think I'm not quite sure whether which which regions, regional initiative is appropriate for to, to deal with like uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, because we have like a new regional, you know, concept like Indo-Pacific, you know, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Anthony said like, you know, Indo-Pacific is one of the like, appropriate uh, regional idea, you know, to, to, to cooperate in, the, in this situation. So, and then you know, maybe, it, maybe it is. So I'm not quite sure, but, you know, because, you know, COVID-19 is kind of world phenomena. So I think, you know, every country try to, to struggle to finding out which kind of framework is, is an appropriate one, you know, to deal with such kind of situations. As it, to deal with like uh, such kind of disease, so uh, I I hope I can I can share my thought my 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 questions my you know doubt you know my uh, uh, questions you know with every you know with all of you. Yeah, and then second uh, the comments I would like to uh, to have you know, towards everyone uh, to share uh, the about the. Uh, uh, the U.S. U.S. China and leadership uh, China confrontations. I think the COVID nineteen is you know escalated the already existing confrontation of the China uh, China uh, uh, China uh, U.S. U.S. you know relationship. So I think even though you know without like COVID nineteen, I think they're still they're still like having a confrontations. But I think COVID nineteen is escalating in the relations that you know intention attend intentions uh, intense uh, the relationship between two countries but I think the uh, currently I, I I can see that you know uh, both China and the US you know have struggle uh, from during the domestic issues that's why they you know they have tend to be like uh, be aggressive in making foreign policy so I think theoretically, I think if, if in the every state, you know, have the domestic problems, they try to divert, you know, the, the people's attention towards the outside. So that's why, you know, they, their foreign policy tend to be like, you know, really like aggressive, you know, towards, you know, towards the partners. So I think in this situation, um, I'm not quite sure how, you know, ASEAN try to like, to get attention, you know, uh, pay, to get attention from from these two big countries towards like multilateralism because you know unless they you know they solve the domestic problems you know especially in China uh, they cannot really like uh, how can I say um, move on towards like multilateralism multilateral cooperation in, in in any kind of field so that's why you know, so no wonder in the U S try to you know try to withdraw the, uh, the from the WHO or like try to withdraw the from from multilateral Lateral corporations, so and so it's kind of difficult, like for ASEAN, not only ASEAN but also other countries to to get attention from these you know two big countries, you know, because they are facing domestic problems rather than like international problems, uh, in in this sense. That's 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 why I, I feel you know when when I look at like current situation of the two uh, the China uh, China US. Uh, uh, the, the relationship, you know, over the competitions uh, of leadership. Right. Okay. I think, um, and then also the last one, last last quick comment as about, about uh, uh, Japanese enga engagement in the COVID nineteen situations. I think as everybody knows, Japan, you know, struggle a lot from like uh, getting recovered from the COVID nineteen. We're still still like in the devastating situation in in COVID nineteen. And I'm not quite sure how how much you know Japanese government can you know can can help or can cooperate with like ASEAN countries. And although like you know we see like a statements you know of the ASEAN Plus Three you know uh, uh, the summit you know in in last April, uh, they try to develop like you know kind of cooperating frameworks you know having the uh, funds you know, having you know yeah but you know. Uh, still like Japan is having like domestic problems, you know. So I think it's it's kind of difficult in these situations, you know, uh for for Japan to 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 take a read. So I'm um, uh so I would like to know what what do you think you know about like Japanese readership, you know, uh that, that uh Professor Anthony. Thank you very much. Well I mute myself. Well Thank you, uh, Professor Suzuki, for that 
comment that focuses largely on what ASEAN could or should be doing, but especially your last comment about the uh, Northeast uh, Asia state, especially Japan. Uh, I think this is a critical question here because the COVID is quite clearly more than an ASEAN regional problem, it's trans-regional. And I think there was an issue also, as Meli will recall, way back when we were looking to how to cross regions to tackle SARS, we actually looked to a couple of Japanese foundations. Of course, you look, when that SARS comes to you in Japan, you are involved, like all of us. So would it not help that you start now cooperating with us? But at that point of time, the Japanese foundations we approached were interested. But again, like you say, no, 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 we are not, no, 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 no. I think here we are looking to what can Japan contribute here because it is as much your problem as it is an ASEAN problem here. And so now, um, let me turn back to uh, Meli to ask for her response and also the questions here. Uh, let me look at some of the questions that we have received. Uh, those that are relevant to us, because there are a large, a large number here, relating more to about the political situation of Hong Kong, US dollar as a current reserve. Uh, those that are more relevant to what we are gathered here for, one is from one of our ASEAN, our RSS colleagues is uh, that, well, the ASEAN countries are managing the uh, pandemics uh, in different ways. And the question here is, what do you, Dr. Meli Anthony, think are the concrete steps ASEAN can do to assist its member countries, which are still struggling with the pandemic in terms of technical assistance, capacity building, and uh, reform of public health systems. And should these be multilateral, bilateral, or both here? Another question is here about Russia has successfully tested a vaccine. Should we in Southeast Asia be looking towards Russia instead of relying on US-China efforts to deal with this pandemic here? Um, let me look and see what the other questions are here. Uh, there's, well, yeah, I think those are the most relevant questions because I don't think we want to go into US arms sales to Taiwan. Okay, so uh, Meli, the floor is back to you to take on what you want. Thanks very much, uh, Chang-Guan. Um, let me see if I can cluster some of the questions together. Um, let me start with your earlier question about then and now. <laughs> what happened in 2003 and now? And I must say, um, in, in RSIS, uh, and I think Pa Yusuf would recall when we had that uh, first pandemic conference in 2009, Pa. And uh, you were even wondering if I could refresh your memory, you know, what a political security analyst like you is doing in a conference on health security. I think the idea then that we wanted to, to put forward is that it really has to be part of the agenda, security agenda of ASEAN. Because when we were looking at 2003, um, and uh, when I was researching on this issue, I was actually quite shocked to find out that un unlike the other areas where you actually have very good sectoral cooperation, the health sector was, it was there, but not perhaps as active as we had expected it to be. And there was no mention of health security in any of the comprehensive security documents in ASEAN. But SARS was really a, a, an eye opener. And to its credit, uh, how did ASEAN deal with this crisis? As you all know, you know the, when, when this news about this outbreak first uh, uh, took place uh, in, in, um, <clears throat> in February of 2003 and the world body was not getting enough information from China, 
Uh, what ASEAN did was uh, actually to make use of its 2000, uh, its APT uh, mechanism, and it, the uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister of Singapore and, and uh, Thailand actually called China to then have a special meeting so that they can have some information about the extent of the crisis, the size outbreak in, <clears throat> in China. And that actually was a very important meeting. You talk about confidence building just to get information and getting things going. That actually started a lot of mechanisms involving the plus three. But within ASEAN, the idea of having a, you know, a task force that dealt with highly pathogenic diseases like SARS. If you recall, some of you, that SARS, when it broke up, pe uh, when it broke up, people didn't quite know what it was. You know, it took a long time for them to decipher what, what that virus actually is. Unlike now, uh, it only took a, within a month to actually decipher the, the whole DNA of, of uh, <laughs> genome of, of COVID-19. So then it was really like shooting in the dark. But the, this is where multilateral frameworks help because whereas the WHO, in fact, the US, the WHO was naming and shaming China for its refusal to cooperate and provide information, it was actually through ASEAN and the ASEAN plus three that they got China involved. That is a very important information that I think all of us that study ASEAN should remember. And as a result of that, several uh, mechanisms, right, uh, grew out of that. And mostly when it comes to information sharing, because as Philip has, has, has mentioned, and this is, you know, you, you can have the best uh, disease surveillance mechanism in the WHO, but at the end of the day, if there's no reporting of diseases at the national level, it's very difficult to get this done. Now, we all know that within the WHO offices, we have what we call a war room. Uh, <laughs> Chongwen and I remember when we went to the WHO office in, uh, in Manila, where it was actually a war room. You, had, you know, all this, you know, the screens, and then the WHO will tell you, or oh, Cambodia, what's happening, Vietnam, what's happening, so all of that. So that actually also helps. So SARS crisis triggered the formation, the establishment of regional mechanisms. And fast forward that to 2019, uh, sorry, not 2019, uh, to it's now to 2020 with COVID-19. It was very interesting because when the news about this pneumonia type diseases was already uh, was already going around in China, the W uh, because we have now these mechanisms in ASEAN, for example, the ASEAN Emergency Operating Center Network, this biodiaspora, these are all information sharing networks that is being coordinated by ASEAN Health Division that brings all the contact points of the health of, of agencies in the region, right? the Chinese contact point in the ASEAN plus three actually informed the ASEAN secretary about what was happening and then the ASEAN secretary then, the, the health division then uh, conveyed the message to all the ASEAN health officials contact point. So that is a very important, uh, when you talk about bilat uh, multilateral, um, how do you say, effort. Um, but when it comes to responding, if bilateral, multilateral efforts are important in getting information and trying to find out what is the nature of the disease, how is this being dealt, so information exchange in the way this is being handled and where the outbreaks are, that is important so that neighboring countries will know what is actually happening. And what happened in SARS in 2003 was it was also realized that laboratories in the region are not fully equipped when it comes to diagnostics. And this is where the ASEAN uh, framework on laboratories network is helping each other. Now the help can come bilaterally because there are certain countries that are really more advanced when it comes to laboratory diagnostics. That's where bilateral help happens. And this is where it's done within the regional uh, part of the regional cooperation agreement. But do, the, do you need the work of the NGOs to help? Definitely yes. But when it comes to information and credibility of information, you still need your officials to do that, right? Because, and, but NGOs are good, um, how do you say, early, early warning, uh, those that can, that can be part of what we call the disease surveillance network. But at the end of the day, their contribution has still to be filtered through the experts because information has to be verified. In, as you can see, in the case of COVID-19, this we are suffering from, uh, infodemics. There's so much information that's going on and it's really, it has to take the w, WHO to tell you that this information is credible or not credible. 
So the long and short of it is, yes, it is a global problem. The response to this must be global, but at multiple levels. So you have from the national to the regional to the international. But the regional part is very critical because in Southeast Asia, as you can see, we don't have the same uh, we don't have the same capacity when it comes to public health system. And this is where, you know, you can attack the WHO for its sensitivity to China, but this technical assistance is very important, especially when it comes to being able to determine what capacity do you lack when it comes to disease uh, surveillance and control. This is one, what they call the joint uh, external evaluation. So, uh, so I think, right, uh, what else is there? Um, on the Russian vaccine, I, I'm not in a position to tell you or to tell you whether it's good or not. I think we leave it to the experts to to to, uh, to decide whether this is uh, safe, or, uh, you know. But what is important, if I talk about beyond Russia, mm -hmm. is the, uh, the the speed by which these vaccines are being developed. On the one hand, I think it is very good because you know, whereas it takes years to develop it, I, I would I would imagine that with science and technology, you can now have different types of vaccines. What to me is more important, apart from its efficacy and its safety, is that you are able to uh, allocate or to distribute this to countries that are most in need, particularly in this part of the world. And again, this is where regional frameworks matter when you think about having a regional stockpile of vaccines or if anything have a pool of resources to actually buy these vaccines and then help it as part of a regional you know regional public good uh, track two yeah we will always have a role I, I think but we need to also work with the health officials because some uh, medical people uh, don't quite feel comfortable with non-medical people working on health issues. But I think we do have a role. Health diplomacy is something that we can all do. Well, thank you, Mally. Up here for one, yeah. Are you finished? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you for that comment. Before I turn to my user one Monday for a comment on our Japanese colleague, Professor Suzuki, about what can Japan do and so on. And I think he has got some views there. Um, could I comment that, uh, I think actually, Emily, that it is about exchange of information here. And I would like to remind or come back to th this panel here. There is another example of piracy in the Straits of Malacca where Japan has taken the lead in helping us establish a recap, a regional center for piracy to collate information. So if we accept that SARS is going to, that COVID is going to be a long-term problem, then maybe we could think of something similar here. Okay, Melly, you got the floor again. Sorry, I forgot. I just was reminded when you talk about the regional mechanism. For, for the longest time, there's been talk about establishing an ASEAN CDC. Right, I think it is idea that uh, has come. Uh, the time has come to do that, and I believe uh, from some information that uh, has been uh, that I, you know, I happen to to hear is that there is now a a study that's being done to actually look at the feasibility of establishing a. a, a it's, they don't call it ASEAN CDC, but a Center for Public Health Emergencies, which, which in a way um, mirrors of, uh, to a certain extent, is similar to you know, a regional center where you can have all of the work that's being done on uh, communication for uh, health emergencies. Right, so I hope that this will really come. They said it's just a feasibility study, and this is something I believe that sh countries in ASEAN should really support. But the problem is, um, you know, we, we sometimes have, uh, to put it, uh, I think we need ASEAN, need, ASEAN countries need to be able to do something and, 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 and proceed with it without relying too much, uh, without depending too much on external assistance, because there's always this thing about who is going to finance this center. <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, the AHA Center is the same. They were able to to come, um, you know, to be established and doing a lot of good work. Uh, but then again, there is a problem of being able to stand on its own sustainability if they, you know, without external assistance. 
but you know if, if you want to nurture something uh, you need of course to support it and I, if there is a, a just you know there's a good cause for this really to be developed in the region right working of course with other partners like japan for example then i you know i think the idea has actually come and talking about japan's health diplomacy we should also not uh, not not uh, ignore the fact that ASEAN, uh, japan is actually um, you know, working with some countries in the region in some in testing some of their therapeutics, for example, some of the drugs that they can actually use to help manage the disease. Right? It's not to prevent it like a vaccine. So Japan has some some developments in that regard, but we don't hear so much about it unless you really dig through the news. So Japan is doing something. Yeah, yeah Yusuf, you want to jump in here and contribute your views on how we can cooperate better with. Northeast Asia, especially Japan, you so? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I have always been now a proponent, you know, that regionalism will be our motto in East Asia if, you know, multilateralism globally is not working. So for that matter, we really have to pay attention, first of course, to the regional institutions that deals with the economy. Because that in East Asia is our main point of cooperation. So RCEP for that matter, uh, uh, you know, APEC and TPP and what have you. And, and, and that is a, a matter of, of very, uh, you know, close cooperation actually possibly, so possible. Number two, I would like to argue that uh, for that matter, you know, uh, Japan and China and Korea, that uh, the, our partners in Northeast Asia, in the APT, in the ASEAN Plus 3 process, are important members who has been actually dealing with a lot of issues which we in Southeast Asia are dealing with. And for that matter, we really has to be closer. And in and, and, and so doing, we keep at least East Asia vibrant and, and, and advanced and, and cooperating closely on so many things that we could do. And we have done that. Uh, Melly uh, has mentioned about what, what happened with SARS, for instance. And now that we actually have a summit of the APT. But then we know about the, and the problems that the relationship bilateral in some instances between Korea and Japan, Japan and China, is, is a little bit strained in some in instances. But for that matter, ASEAN, therefore, is a very important conduit interlocutor to be able to move on, on on these issues. Third, we need the APT because ASEAN alone in this kind of things right now, we are facing this investment that we should do on the center, on the CDC or whatever you would like to have the COVID center as mentioned in the statement of the APT summit. But nobody is preparing that. Actually, ASEAN has to take the lead, but ASEAN has no money to take the lead. So therefore, we really need some more involvement of the ASEAN plus three process. And, and that's why I, I argue that since regionalism is our method to deal with each other uh, in our, in, in our uh, you know, East Asian region, let's, why, why don't we put our attention and, and actually, uh, 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 you know, and, and the full cooperation there instead. And, 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 and especially Japan, of course, with Southeast Asia has been very close for a long time. So we should do much more, actually. Uh, we have, because of the China's rise, sometimes just forget how important Japan has been and still is for, you know, ASEAN. So that is why I was uh, very much, of, 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 now I'm a, very much a proponent you know, of, of this uh, cooperation. Mary, and I hope on this issue also, you know, your, your point is well taken about, that, uh, um, let's concentrate now possibly as a beginning on this vaccine cooperation. You know, why don't you take the lead or Singapore take the lead to, to concentrate on this? Because so many of us are already dealing with so many, you know, uh, groups that are uh, pro producing this vaccine. I'm only worried that, uh, if it comes to the crunch, then we, we our, our, you know, cooperation 
is 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 being being divided because of all this interest. There is no in in uh, I think mingling with so many with so many people involved. So I hope that uh, you can take that 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 possibility. I think it's a very good start for the health issues. And and I agree, the uh, health issues is one of the most important now security factor for each of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Yusof. Um, time is running out. We have got other questions, but they all relate to issues of geopolitics of the Quad and China-US uh, relations, which is not quite the focus of this uh, webinar here. So I would now, I think, in fact, you at the time running out, like to turn to Ambassador Ong for any concluding remarks here. Uh, but on the vaccine issue, developing a vaccine is one, manufacturing it is another. And I think we have to look to places like Indonesia where you got a tremendous pharmaceutical industry and whether that can be done there. So again, there in that vaccine, developing, cooperating, manufacturing, distributing it, it is a regional effort. Okay, Ambassador Ong. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, just a quick follow up on what Mr. Kwa Chang Wan said about the vaccine, the development of vaccine. In fact, Indonesia is working with the United Arab Emirates, uh, which in turn is working with the uh, Russians and others to develop this vaccine. And I learned that uh, 4,000 COVID patients in the Surabaya area have been designated to go on trial for the third stage of a particular vaccine which the UAE and Indonesia are working on. So this is good news and I'm glad that uh, Papa Yusuf Anandi and uh, Professor Meli uh, talk about how ASEAN can work together to contribute to the development of that scene. What is important going forward, uh, dear colleagues, is that we should not allow the discovery of this vaccine to further divide all of us in this global community. Yeah. So we have enough of nationalism already. So we should not have a vaccine nationalism. We should have a vaccine multilateralism. Yeah. And I think in this respect, Professor Suzuki, Sane Suzuki should examine the possibility of Japan talking, articulating more about the need for us all to work together on what we call vaccine multilateralism. The challenge for us in ASEAN is always that we look for the Santa Claus from Japan. But today, we are aware that Japan has its own domestic challenges and we are not just relying on Japanese financial support. What we want is the Japanese voice. Japan is in G7, Japan is in G20, Japan is in many other international bodies and the Japanese voice is respected in all these forums. So, we are not there, except for we in ASEAN, we are not there, except for Indonesia, uh, which is in the G20. Uh, but having one single voice in the G20 is not enough. So Japan is there. I think Japan and Indonesia talking about what is happening in ASEAN with regard to our effort to combat uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 will be very uh, powerful. Yeah? It's more than what money we can get from Tokyo. So I think this is something that Japanese colleagues can think about. The new world that I talked about just now when I make the opening remarks is really that we have to think differently, we have to act differently, yeah? and we must believe differently. Yeah? We cannot go back to the old 
playbook and say uh, the rich guys from Japan, the rich guy from Singapore, the rich guy from the European and uh, United States of America can help us. No, every one of us has a role, whether you are rich or poor. The important thing is how to present our case to the global stage, to the global community. So if the Japanese government or the Japanese leadership take on a more active role in articulating the story of how we in ASEAN and Japan are combating COVID-19 at the coming East Asia Summit, I think people will sit up and listen. So don't just allow the East Asia Summit to be a forum uh, or a platform for certain other subjects or certain other country just to keep talking about how much they are prepared to do, how much they are contributing. But in the end, nothing came. So Japan can be the voice, voice for ASEAN in many places where ASEAN is not present. So this is an important uh, uh, point that I wish to put across in this uh, uh, seminar on the web. Going forward, I think we have a good interesting discussion. Um, when we put out this idea, maybe of navigating geopolitical risks, I am very sure everybody wants to ask you about all those things that Chairman Kwa uh, Jong-Wan has no time for, which is about Taiwan, which is about arms this and arms that. Yeah. But there is a nature of this whole topic, and I like to thank in particular Pak uh, Yusof Wanandi, who insists that we should do this. And uh, CSIS uh, groups and now RSIS, we all come together. And in the last two, uh, in these two seminars, uh, this one that we have now and the last one uh, a few weeks ago, uh, hosted by CSIS, we have covered most of what I call the technical health issues. So we look forward to the one to be hosted by groups. Yeah, Professor Suzuki, you and your colleague will have to be extra ready to talk about all these geopolitical issues. Yeah? Unless your uh, Professor Urata say, uh, I am only confining myself to certain specific area. Yeah, of course, this is a very dicey uh, kind of uh, stage to uh, examine all these geopolitical challenges. But I think it is good to do that. Yeah, uh, we can present it in our scholarly way, which is not a threat to anybody. The last point I want to make is that this idea of the ASEAN CDC, Professor Mary mentioned, is important. Actually, in each of our country, Japan included, we already have what we call the CDC for our national level. Yeah, even a small, uh, relatively undeveloped place in ASEAN, such as Myanmar or Laos, they have the little CDC. Yeah? It is maybe a unit in the Ministry of Health or a department in a hospital. What is important is that the people manning all these CDC or CDC units, they are excited about being able to connect with the rest of us in the circuit, the rest of the people facing the same challenges. So it is important for us not to overemphasize the resource part of the CDC proposal. We must look at how we connect the existing personnel, the long-suffering uh, scientists who have been in this kind of CDC work. Secondly, if I am a ASEAN Secretary General today, I will put a proposal to the ASEAN Member State to prepare a one-page memo or two pages of a memo to go to people like the Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to ask them from an ASEAN regional perspective, we wish to develop this thing called the ASEAN CDC. Can private sector donation, can the wealthy NGOs help to contribute to it? It's not a lot of money. Because if we are clever enough to organize all the existing experts we have in all the little CDC that we have in Japan, in 
the ASEAN countries, we can be very sizable. So it's just the act of coming together and using what we have today. Uh, webinar, Zoom, uh, uh, whatever electronic platform, we can do more. The first thing about tackling the pandemic must be, number one, how do we share information quickly? Yeah. Don't allow it to get into the bureaucratic system. Once you get into the bureaucratic system, we will ask ourselves, is this a secret that we can tell our friend in the other country or not? Uh, then we come to this situation where we do not know what is happening. So I think going forward, uh, this kind of uh, gathering that we have help us refresh our own thinking, bring us closer to some, what I call, um, concrete action yeah? and many uh, presentation today yeah, has uh, built on what uh, Dr. Marty Nadarakawa has said to us uh, at his club a few weeks ago and I wish to thank all of the participants yeah, for making the time for us and I look forward to uh, the next uh, seminar uh, a few weeks on the road. Uh, I pass the floor back to you, uh, Kwa Chung Wan. Well, thank you, Ing Yong. On that very positive note, I join you in thanking all our participants who have been on this uh, seminar with us for the last two hours, an hour and a half. And we will remind all of you that our Japanese colleagues Scripps, will host the third seminar on Thursday, the 10th of September at 1400 or 2 o'clock uh, Japan time, an hour and a half. And Dr. Sujiro Urata, the Professor Emeritus at Wasada, will be speaking on strengthening resilience of supply chains in the Indo-Pacific region towards economic growth in the post-pandemic era. Is a very optimistic title that we're already looking to the post-pandemic era <laughs> and I hope to see all of you uh, on that uh, 10th of September at 1400 hours. So a very good evening to all of you and thank you once again. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you.